Well, thank you very much, Peter, for that introduction and for inviting me uh, to this fifth summit uh, for space sustainability. It's really a pleasure to be with you all uh, this morning. Peter, thank you for your tireless efforts uh, and your leadership on behalf of space governance. It is greatly appreciated uh, in the United Nations as it is elsewhere. Ladies and gentlemen, it really is uh, both a privilege to speak to you today and I take it also as an opportunity to, to connect uh, with you on issues which are of increasing significance uh, in the space of the United Nations. And yet this is not a new uh, concern for our organisation. Pretty much since its establishment back in 1945, the United Nations has been an active partner in the development of space law and standards uh, and indeed COPUAS, the Committee for the Peaceful Use of Outer Space, uh, came into, uh, into being just two years uh, after Sputnik was launched and from Sputnik to Starship, outer space governance has been woven into the fabric of the United Nations system and its peaceful and sustainable use has been one of its major preoccupations and in many respects one of its proudest uh, achievements. And building on this long experience and considering the unprecedented changes, you've referred to them, Peter, that are ongoing in space, our Secretary General Antonio Guterres has been speaking often about the need to step up space diplomacy, looking together to find paths forward and to make a breakthrough in space governance. And that is why, as Peter has outlined, outer space was prominently featured in the Secretary General's seminal report, Our Common Agenda, and why a policy brief, which was issued at the end of May, uh, was dedicated to this topic. And let me say straight away that our ambitions, and we hope that we share them with you, for, space, for, for governance in space uh, is driven simply by necessity. And four issues stand out and need to be addressed. The number of objects in orbit, space debris, deep space missions, and space resources. Ladies and gentlemen, the most obvious and perhaps the most extraordinary change in recent years has been the sheer number of objects being launched into space. And the fact that more objects have been launched in the last 10 years than in the previous 50 years combined offers, I think, boundless development opportunities and governance needs. There has been some slow and steady progress in governing this changing environment, but there is also a risk that we can fall behind in our global coordination. Today, national and regional entities monitor space activities with different sets of standards, best practices, definitions, languages, and modes of interoperability. And a lack of coordination amongst the different stakeholders can make it harder for countries and for enterprises with limited space situational awareness to operate their assets in an increasingly complex environment. And if we cannot agree on how to coordinate space traffic management, we risk both the safety and the sustainability of space through accidents that will lead to the destruction of orbits and worryingly the breach of peace and security in outer space. So what we need is to accelerate our work. The opportunities are too great and the risks are too high to do otherwise. And that leads me to the second major issue I've mentioned, space debris. Uh, we know that there are millions of fragments orbiting the Earth that could do significant damage to space assets, and this is a challenge that is compounded by the exponentially large number of satellites that we launched into orbit this decade, and the lack of restraints on the testing or use of destructive anti-satellite systems. Uh, I've learnt what the Kessler syndrome is in recent months. I'm sure you know all about it. I reference it just to make the point. A significant governance challenge before us is that there is no international mechanism or body to monitor state space debris 
nor to facilitate its removal. For those countries and those companies that can afford expensive monitoring and tracking resources, this may be less of a problem. But for smaller countries and the burgeoning group of space startups, many of whom I believe are here today, this stands as a major challenge. We are, of course, inspired by technology that is emerging on satellite recovery, refueling, and deorbiting, but those same hopes come equally with risks. In the absence of appropriate norms and principles, the use of these technologies can be a source both of tension and of conflict. And that brings me to the two other issues for consideration, deep space missions and the management of space resources. Let me start by saying how inspired I am, and I know I'm not alone, when reading about the planned return to deep space. I'm looking around the room and I have to confess that I was 13 years old when Neil Armstrong set foot on the moon, and it captivated me in a generation. Quite literally, I can remember flickering images on a black and white television as if it were, were yesterday. The bravery, the audacity, the talent of those astronauts and engineers is remarkable by the standards of any era. And I think that it is thrilling that we are on the cusp of returning to deep space as a civilization. And here I have to say that this is beyond political calculation. This is a matter of humanity. This type of endeavor, these types of achievements, I think stand as things which can unite a world uh, where very few issues, I fear, unite as easily uh, today. And that makes our work all the more urgent, all the more necessary. Long-term human presence in deep space and on celestial bodies is going to require the use of in situ resources for survival and for return. And whilst there is ongoing review of these issues within the UN Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space in Vienna, there is not yet an agreed international framework on space resources, space resource exploration, exploitation and utilization, nor a mechanism to support its future implementation. So we need to come to agreement on how space resources will be used and how we can protect landing sites like those from the Apollo and Venerous missions and how we will ensure that industry can fairly access resources and bring benefits to all of humanity. We've been inspired in recent times by breakthroughs in the governance on the high seas. Think back to the UN law of the sea adopted back in the 1980s and what has followed from it, guided by the principle of the common heritage of humankind. And this clearly shares characteristics to outer space where countries and industry came together to solve a governance challenge. Governance of the seas was necessary, became evident in the 1980s. Governance of outer space in new ways is clearly needed today. So there's more work to be done, but all of this provides us with the confidence that the kinds of agreements concluded in the past are possible in the future, even in today's admittedly challenging geopolitical climate. So what do the solutions look like as we see them? We have a window of opportunity over the next 15 months, which uh, is a period leading up to the United Nations Summit of the Future, where we can accelerate space diplomacy and advance the governance issue that I've out outlined with you this morning. There will be meetings of COPUS, the World Space Forum in Austria, and a conference on management and sustainability of outer space activities hosted by Portugal next spring. Working groups and expert groups in the field of outer space disarmament are also meeting to develop new measures. And the Pact for the Future will be negotiated at the Summit of the Future next September. At each of these points, ladies and gentlemen, we can bring together governments, industry, civil society, academia, 
to advance a shared set of goals. We need to advance on agreement for frameworks to govern space traffic, space debris, and resource management. And these frameworks, we believe, would be best managed within one single unified regime to facilitate data sharing, cooperation, and continuity. But an alternative is that they be agreed separately if that path looks likelier to achieve results. We also need agreements on norms, rules, and principles to prevent an extension of armed conflict into outer space and to prevent its weaponization. Copuus itself would also need to establish an international mechanism or to appoint uh, to adapt an existing office to implementation these new sets of governance frameworks. The institutional needs for administering the governance of 21st century space would in all likelihood be very different from those required in the past. And I think we should act on that realization. Lastly, critically, we need to ensure that there is the greatest possible involvement and collaboration amongst all concerned actors. By that, I mean a more inclusive set of voices on outer space governance. So we must ensure that these new frameworks provide a platform for both private sector and civil society input alongside, of course, the decision making prerogatives of our member states. We need to encourage and to facilitate greater participation from women in a sector which has remained stubbornly gender imbalanced. We need voices from countries that are new actors in outer space and those that still aspire to be that. Ultimately, governments are the ones who will set the rules and agree on the frameworks that govern outer space, but they would benefit from, I would say they need, your voices, your inputs. So I want to thank you for bringing this conversation to New York, Peter, and for engaging with the United Nations this morning. This has to continue. For decades, the United Nations has served as a platform to bring people together, to solve problems, and to unleash human potential. We are all living in an extraordinary era of outer space activity, innovation, discovery and opportunity. And if we actively work together, capitalizing on these opportunities that we have in the coming months, I believe that we can build up a space governance architecture that will benefit outer space activity today and the spacefarers of far future generations. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, Guy, for those very inspiring remarks in your keynote. Um, we have time for a few questions. Um, I'd just like to sort of pull on some of the threads that you, that you mentioned. Um, you, you spoke in your keynote about the, um, the, the vision that the Secretary General has laid out for the future of international governance in his, uh, our common agenda document. And uh, he calls for more agile, inclusive, and innovative diplomacy. What, what does this look like in practical terms? I mean, I'm, I'm expect, you know, not, not in the space sector, but other domains as well that are sure. facing similar global challenges. What, sure. Well, look, I think if you take the broadest possible look at uh, the Secretary General's intentions, and it's all captured in this report, which I would refer you to, our, our common agenda. Uh, the notion is that we live in a rapidly changing world, opportunities, risks arising with sometimes uh, bewildering speed and on an extraordinary uh, scale. Uh, his ambition uh, is to win support for a reworking of multilateral cooperation, basically to render all the different areas to which the United Nations has responsibilities, uh, to render its governance capacities fit for purpose in rapidly changing circumstances. Now, let's be honest, what worked yesterday will not necessarily work tomorrow. That is not a recipe or a reason to jettison everything that's existed up until this point. 
but it can be a very strong, I think, reason uh, to add, adapt, uh, modify, improve what we have. So in the field of outer space, Peter, you know, we have, I think, and let's not ignore it, a very solid record of achievement. Uh, everything that has taken place in Vienna, the work of copiers, you've been involved in it, you know it much better than I do. There is a record of achievement, uh, and it's a very solid platform from which to start, but we need to build upon it. So I think that is the, the mood and the challenges that will face our member states when they come to consider these issues next September at the Summit of the Future. Thank you. Um, as, uh, as many people here in the audience know, the UN has a dedicated office for outer space affairs in Vienna that, among other things, maintains the International Register for Space Objects and provides the secretariat function for the UN Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space. We can imagine that as the volume and, and uh, tempo of space activities increases, that this, will, this office will come under a greater pressure to meet uh, its mandate and achieve the goals of enhancing space governance. Um, what does this mean for UN USA and, and the UN system in terms of how, how these, this office can be uh, adequately um, resourced and capacitated to, to deal with the greater tempo of space activities? Yeah, Peter, as I was saying, uh, uh, we do have, I think, this remarkable uh, asset in Vienna, uh, the Office and the Committee uh, on Outer Space Activities, and uh, uh, their achievements are considerable, not least when you consider the very limited resources uh, that they have at their disposal to bring uh, to the job. Uh, I think the precise answer to your question is going to have to wait for the determinations that are made uh, by our member states uh, next September at the Summit of the Future. But it seems to me the mood, so far as I can judge it up until this point at least, uh, is that uh, we need to reinforce what exists in Vienna. This is not a matter of replacing or, or, or shifting our capacities from one location to another, but it is rather, I think, to, uh, to reinforce what we have. And yeah, as, uh, as for very many things, and, and we feel this constantly, uh, resources are a key. Uh, we, we believe that governance, particularly in the outer space uh, uh, area, is one which is going to require significant investment, both by our member states and by the partners that we hope to involve in those uh, activities. But let's not think there's going to be a complete break with what we've had in the past. It is very much an accretional but accelerating process of construction of new governance mechanisms. Thank you. And um, continuing then on, the, on the, this uh, theme of the Summit of the Future that um, was uh, sort of a golden thread running through your, your keynote, um, you referenced a number of events coming up before the summit. And just for the people here in the audience uh, and those online uh, who would like to engage in this issue, what are the, what are the possibilities? What's next? Yeah, if we could predict the future, we'd be probably in other businesses, but it's a great question. Uh, New York is a city of summits. You've got your own summit today. We have a summit uh, this September uh, to try to advance uh, progress on the Sustainable Development Goals, the so-called 2030 Agenda, which is a blueprint for, uh, for global sustainable development. Uh, regrettably, we're well off track. Let's just, let's just take a hard look at where we've come. Halfway along the, uh, the road of delivering on our Sustainable Development Goals, they were adopted in 2015. They're supposed to be delivered by 2030. Uh, we're halfway along the road. Only 12% of our targets are on track. So we're falling short. So we need a summit to push forward the whole development agenda. And that's uh, the link to the, uh, the summit of the future next year. Uh, this summit is not a competing agenda with the 2030 agenda. It is a way of turbocharging, is the word our Secretary General uses, progress towards the SDGs. And uh, if you get a chance to look at our policy brief on outer space, we make the link of how good governance in outer space can rebound to advance all areas of sustainable development in the here and the now. This is not an esoteric, distance, futuristic agenda. It is for the here and now, and it rebounds very, very strongly uh, into the policy areas of today. We'll see if our member states are capable of coming up with a strong pact of the future at the level of the Secretary General's ambitions. The Secretary General is avowedly ambitious in what he's putting on the table. Uh, he's encouraging all of us uh, to present to our member states what we believe needs to be done uh, 
uh, in our current circumstances, not what we believe our member states are in a position to come to a consensus upon. So we'll have to see how that uh, ambition and that uh, capacity for consensus building converge or fail to converge. But one thing is undeniable. Uh, in outer space and in many other issues, and we'll be taking up issues of peace and security, digital transformation, uh, international financial architecture, our circumstances are such that we need to take bold, innovative action. Uh, it's unrealistic to be less ambitious. Thank you. Um, yes, and for those of you who haven't yet had a chance to read our common agenda or the recently released uh, uh, space policy brief or, or um, brief, uh, policy brief number seven, I encourage you to look those up. They're very easy to find uh, online. And uh, it, sh it shares um, uh, the, uh, the insights, the thinking uh, of the uh, UN Secretary General. And um, uh, I think it's, it's very uh, exciting to see that space governance really is receiving attention at those highest levels in the UN. Well, Mr. Ryder, thank you so much for sharing your time uh, with us today. I know you have other pressing engagements to return to uh, back at the UN, so really appreciate you taking the time this morning to come and give us your keynote and uh, share a little bit of the uh, insights of the, the thinking in the UN system around space governance issues. So thank you very much. Thank you, Peter.